ACL injuries are the most common type of sports related knee injury and it's therefore really important to have a good understanding of them and how to manage them. Now in this video we're going to have a look at the basic anatomy of the knee and the function of the ACL joint. We're then going to look at the mechanism of injury and I'm going to give some examples of uh, injuries to the ACL. We're going to talk about the clinical features and how they present. We'll then go through some investigations and again I'll give some examples and some demonstrations of the investigations you can do in the specific tests. And finally we'll discuss the management. And I'll leave the timestamps down below in the uh, description if you want to click through to a specific part of that. So without further ado, let's move on to the anatomy with this handy diagram here. So we're looking at the right knee, and you can tell this because the fibula is always lateral and it has the lateral collateral ligament attaching to it. So the anterior cruciate ligament is the one right through the middle indicated by the diagram now, which um, is called the cruciate ligament because it's shaped like a cross, Latin for cross is cruciate. Now this is the strongest ligament in the joint and it attaches to the intercondylar region of the tibia and prevents the uh, anterior dislocation of the tibia over the femur. So this is the tibia and this is the femur. It prevents it from going forwards because it holds it in place just there. So it stops the forward motion. And that's basically all you need to know unless you want to go into greater amounts of detail and become a surgeon of the knee. So now that we've discussed the anatomy, it's time to talk about the most important part for doctors, which is the mechanism of injury, how it happens and how you can detect whether they've done this before you need to do any investigations. Um, so there's three main ways in which the anterior cruciate ligament can become injured and that all depends upon the anatomy. So if this is my tibia and this is my femur and they're joined like this, the first way is twisting of the knee joint, rapid twisting on a flex knee. So the knee has to be slightly flexed because it puts increased strain on the anterior cruciate ligament, which is coming between the two. And then a high twisting force is going to potentially cause a tear. Secondly, hyperextension of the knee like this. And thirdly is if you have a rapid and hard force to the back of the tibia. So therefore the anterior cruciate ligament is going to become stressed and potentially snap because the tibia is going to go forwards and that's the entire action that the anterior cruciate ligament is stopping and trying to prevent. So now that we know a couple of the mechanisms of injury, I'm going to go and look at some examples and then we can discuss how they might have happened. So this first example with Brazilian forward Ronaldo is probably as much of a clear cut example as you could possibly hope for of an ACL tear. It's the hard force onto the partially flexed back of the tibia. Um, and this is basically a classical scenario. But this second example kind of illustrates more that it's very often a non-specific twisting injury of the knee and it's very difficult to differentiate between whether it's a medial ligament, uh, a posterior cruciate ligament, or even a meniscal tear on just inspection of the injury. So what risk factors are there for an anterior cruciate ligament injury? Well, there's two very obvious ones. Acute trauma, so we said about twisting or a heavy force to the back of the tibia. And also, of course, a previous history of anterior cruciate ligament tears that's going to weaken the ligament. But um, other things, for example, a uneven playing surface, that's going to increase the risk of a twist on the knee. Uh, sports such as football or rugby, where there is a lot of twisting, which is quite a lot of high energy sports um, nowadays. And finally, um, the use of cleats or spikes, so cleats are the shoes that clip into bike pedals whilst you're cycling. Spikes are the shoes with spikes on that athletes use when they're running. Both of these are going to reduce the mobility of the foot and the ankle joint and therefore increase the stress on the anterior cruciate ligament because the knee is going to be doing more twisting. So now it's time to discuss some of the clinical features, what the patient might present to you with. So number one is an audible pop. They often say, I could hear a pop when the uh, injury happened. This happens in about 70% of cases, so it doesn't definitely mean that it is an anterior cruciate ligament, and it doesn't mean that it's not if it's not present, but it does increase the clinical suspicion greatly. Secondly is rapid swelling of the joint within the first two hours, so that's called hemoarthrosis, and that's because the anterior cruciate ligament has a really good blood supply from the lateral genicular artery, um, so when it's torn, there's going to be rapid swelling of the uh, joint space. 
thirdly, you're going to get knee pain. This is a very, very variable thing. Some people have little knee pain. Some people report large amounts of knee pain. So it's very difficult to um, understand whether it's a ligament injury or not based solely on the amount of pain that they're having. So those were all kind of acute problems, what you might see if you're a pitch side doctor um, and what the patient might report straight away. But what if you're in a GP and a patient comes in and you're wondering if they have an ACL tear? What might they say to you? So the first thing is an inability to weight bear at the time of the injury. So they might say that they just were hobbling about, not able to walk on the foot. And, simil on, and similarly, the um, inability to return to sports in any normal degree of time. It might take them a long, long time to get back to the sports because of pain. Alongside this, and number two, is the fact that when they do return to the sport, the knee constantly feels like it's going to give way or buckle. And that's because of the loss of the stability in the joint. As we said in the anatomy, the ACL is the strongest ligament in the joint and the most responsible for providing the joint with stability. So if you lose the ACL, you're going to lose stability in the joint. And thirdly, you can get pain on the lateral epicondyle, the femur. And this is a common differential for um, a lateral meniscal tear as well. So you have to do more investigations, take into account all the rest of the history to differentiate between the two. But this is because the femur and the tibia are going to bash against each other um, when the ACL tears occasionally, and that could cause bruising of the bone and therefore present with pain. So now moving on to the tests which you can perform at the pitch side. So the first of these is the anterior draw test, which is the very common one that everybody knows about for the ACL. So you have the patient lying in a supine position with their hip flexed at 45 degrees and their knee at 90 degrees. You sit on the patient's foot and then you take hold of the tibia, the tibial tuberosity, and pull it anteriorly with a lot of force because in order to feel for a sublaxed and uh, a weakened ACL, you really have to pull with quite a lot of force, which some people don't realize. If their ACL is intact, then this won't cause them any pain at all. So it's a positive test if the end is quite weak and there's a little bit of gif and they call it spongy or soft. The second test is the Latchman's test. Um, which is apparently the most accurate maneuver for detecting an acute ACL tear. So again, you lay the patient supine, but this time you bend the knee to 20 to 30 degrees. You put the right thumb on the tibial tuberosity, then your left hand on their thigh, and you pull the tibia anteriorly. And again, if you have a soft end point, then that's a positive test. This final test is the pivot shift maneuver. So again, patient lying down, you lift the leg up to 20 degrees of flexion, and then you uh, place your hand on the calcaneus to encourage internal rotation of the tibia and encourage full extension and flexion of the knee. And if there's a clunk at 30 degrees, then that is a positive test for the ACL rupture. And this uh, pivot shift maneuver is much more useful in a GP when you're looking at more of a chronic picture. So now that we've discussed the pitch side test that you can do to increase or decrease your clinical suspicion of an ACL tear, it's time to discuss what they might do for you in hospital. So the first thing they'll do is apply the Ottawa knee rules to see whether or not you need an x-ray of your knee. So this is four rules. So age over 55, they might be. Uh, if they're unable to weight bear on the knee, they probably will be unable to weight bear with an ACL. Isolated pain over the patella or the fibula, they probably have isolated pain over the fibula, potentially, they could not as well. And finally, active flexion of less than 90 degrees. Um, that shouldn't be affected. So there's a potential that they might do an x-ray. So on the x-ray, they're basically ruling out any fractures of the uh, knee and the, the surrounding bones. And there shouldn't be any fractures associated with an ACL, but you may be able to see the effusion or the hemiarthrosis, as we called it earlier. The gold standard for an ACL is an MRI. So you can see the tearing of the ligament with um, an increased frequency um, and you might be able to see a change in shape and you can also rule out other things that might be clinically suspected such as a, uh, a collateral ligament tear or the medial meniscus tear. So now I'd just like to touch on the management for an ACL and this is more focusing around the GP or the hospital setting after you've already got your diagnosis from investigations into an ACL. And with all things, there's three stages to this. There's your conservative, your medical, and your surgical management. 
So these are kind of risks stratified based on the type of patient in front of you. So conservative management tends to be withheld for sedentary patients, so year older population that have not done the ACL doing sports. Uh, so this would be protected weight bearing, you'd do RICE, so rest, ice, compression, elevation, and you'd give them some pain relief and perhaps some cautious physiotherapy. Uh, if you've got your more moderate, moderate intensity patients, then you're going to have some formal physiotherapy, quite intensive, to try and regain some strength and stability in the knee joint. And finally, if you've got a more intense dynamic demand on the knee, so perhaps a, a very active young person or a, a high-end sports athlete, they're going to require surgical reconstruction because the ACL uh, never truly heals. So without surgical intervention, you can't ever compete at the highest level um, because the joint will not be fully uh, supported. So the most common surgery at the moment is a hamstring tendon graft. Uh, but you can also have a bone patella tendon bone autograft, or you can sometimes there's um, evidence for a cadaveric autograft. And then you really need to have some intense physiotherapy following this. So that basically sums up the ACL and make sure you leave any comments down below if you have any questions. Um, but thanks very much for watching and make sure you subscribe if there's any if you want to see any more videos like this in the future.